fellow mech warriors, Mage Leader here. Welcome back to the Battle Mech Primer, the series where we take nice long looks at pictures I downloaded from Google Images the day before. You know, in all my travels throughout the Inner Sphere, I've seen a lot of battle mechs. I've tangoed with stalkers, wrestled with Jenners, brutally murdered urban mechs, and taken down mongooses. Mongoose? Mongoosen? Whatever, I've blown them up. The point is, I've got a lot of experience with a wide variety of battle mechs, from the mighty Atlas all the way down to the humble flea, and I've learned a thing or two about their design, as well as the crazy field of arms development. And when it comes to the concept of battle mechs, I've found that there are several factors that often go unappreciated. We all love to talk about the fancy weapon systems, the pilot interface, the grit of the noble mech warriors who pilot the damn things, but armchair historians like myself often forget the little guy. Much like the jet fighters of ancient Terra, for every hotshot maverick in the pilot seat, there's a virtual army of support staff keeping the lights on and the equipment in tip-top condition. The battle mech is not a simple machine. These things contain thousands upon thousands of delicate, sensitive doodly-bobs and fragile thingamajigs that, if broken, will leave a mech severely weakened or worse, outright dead. This is an immutable principle of weapons design. You need to take into account not only the end user, but also the poor son of a bitch who has to keep the thing repaired. There's a running joke about how engineers and mechanics hate one another, and it stems from a failure of designers to take the needs of the maintenance teams into account when conceptualizing their machines. Battle mechs are no exception. The Battlemaster, for example, despite being a pristine, high-tech piece of technological wizardry, is also incredibly maintenance-intensive. The parts are rare and almost all proprietary, and while it might be an absolute joy to pilot one, repairing it is the kind of nightmare that would make Freddy Krueger shit his pants. Many other mechs are known to have similar issues, especially in a time when the factories making the spare parts have all been destroyed, and anyone who knew how the things actually worked has long since been killed off. But there is one battle mech that made an effort to buck this trend, a machine that was groundbreaking not for anything it did on the field, but for what it achieved in the hangar. That's the machine we're going to examine today. In this video, we're going to take a look at the Crab. Opinions on the Crab are fairly mixed. Much like assholes, everyone's got one. Also, much like the aforementioned sphincters, the majority of them are shitty. Your average mech warrior will tell you that the Crab is a basic machine, an unremarkable medium mech that can do its job and nothing more. Those who pilot medium mechs often turn up their noses at it, preferring more specialized, powerful, or more maneuverable options. But to the mechanics who keep the things running behind the scenes, the Crab is possibly the greatest battle mech ever conceived. The first Crab rolled off the assembly line of Kosara weaponries in 2719 as a battle mech intended for the SLDF. These were the golden years of battle mech design, and the final few of the Star League itself. In just two years, Alexander Kerensky would graduate from Tharkad University, a handsome, dashing young man with a bright future ahead of him. In less than 50 years, the Ameris Civil War would leave the Star League and hundreds of worlds decimated from a truly terrifying galactic-scale conflict. Billions would die, and history would be forever changed, only to be immediately outdone by a new war that made the Ameris coup look like a friendly game of thumb wrestling. Of course, nobody knew this dark future lay just over the horizon, and for Kosara, it was a time of opportunity. The SLDF had a need. A need for a battle mech that could operate behind enemy lines, virtually unsupported for extended periods of time. It needed to be quick, durable, cheap, and above all, easy to maintain. To this end, Kosara began working on the Crab, and what they came up with was truly impressive. The battle mech they produced was the CRB-27, which boasted a suite of the latest and greatest armor and sensor technology. It incorporated lessons learned over the past century in order to make the most efficient battle mech ever built. And from a purely logistical perspective, what they achieved was nothing short of miraculous. In support of its intended purpose, the Crab was given a loadout comprised entirely of energy-based weaponry in order to avoid the need for ammunition. Each of the claws carries a Ramtech 1200 large laser, and distributed across the body are two medium lasers and a small laser. These weapons, while heat intensive and lacking the serious punch of an autocannon, are more than adequate for most engagements. 
On top of that, the use of lasers over projectile or missile-based systems allows the crab to perform its duties for far longer without any form of resupply. It comes standard with an impressive Dalban Series K comm system, allowing it to report on its findings or call for backup at extreme range. It has a respectable top speed of 86.4 kph, which allows it to outrun more or less anything that it can't destroy. But that's far from the crab's best feature. Those just make the battle mech serviceable. What makes the crab special is what's under the hood. The crab was designed with the mechanic in mind first and foremost. The internal components had all been designed from the ground up to be as simple as possible, with as few complicated moving parts as they could get away with. Every single piece, from the foot pad to the canopy, was built to be easily removed and replaced, so as to cut down on the maintenance workload. On extended tours of duty, where resupply was infrequent and limited in scope, this was a godsend. A damaged crab could be brought back into the fight far quicker and easier than its older medium mech brethren. While the simpler parts meant that it could never reach the same pinnacle of performance as some of its contemporaries, its cost-effective maintenance cycle was immensely attractive to the SLDF. It was so popular, in fact, that throughout the military, the term crab walk came to replace cakewalk as a default slang term for an easy assignment. The crab's design was said to be revolutionary, a new gold standard for future battle mechs to follow. Sadly, that would never become a reality, as just when things were kicking off for Kosara, some fat Rimworld's fuck decided it was time to make a power play. The Amira Civil War would put future plans for the Crab on hold. After all, it's hard to negotiate military contracts with the government when nobody's sure if it even still exists. The end of the war didn't improve their fortunes either, as the Star League died its slow, agonizing death at the hands of ambitious house lords and other such bureaucrats, Kosara struggled to keep the lights on. Then, after Alexander Kerensky ran off to God knows where with his army and a hefty supply of crabs, the First Succession War began. As I'm sure you're already aware, the First War of the Suck led to the loss of most of the big battle mech factories during the opening salvos, and Kosara's crab plant, being located on the high-profile world of Northwind, was one of the first to be destroyed. By the start of the war, there were about 1,000 crabs left in the Inner Sphere. Once the wars finally blew over, there were barely a hundred. All that innovation, all that effort put into changing the face of mech production, faded into the pages of history books, and the crab quickly became just another medium mech. It served its pilots and mechanics well, just as it always had, but with spare parts getting rarer and rarer every day, the advantages offered by those special proprietary components began to have the opposite effect, making repairs more costly and difficult to perform. Many mech warriors as well began to see the streamlined construction as a hindrance to the mech's performance, and would modify the living shit out of their machines to push it to the limit. Fortunately, the story of the crab doesn't end there. The discovery of the Helm Memory Core was a massive boon to the Inner Sphere, and also to Kosara, who used the newfound technology to not only restore their components factories to bring the existing crabs back up to their original specs, but also rebuild their production line on Northwind. In the early 3050s, just in time for the clan invasion, brand new crabs began to roll out into circulation once more. Since that time, it's become one of the more popular medium mechs as mercenaries and house armies alike began to recognize the benefits of its simplicity. The Crab has also become a favorite of smaller mercenary companies in recent years, as its newfound availability and ease of maintenance makes it an attractive option for warriors on a budget. While in battle it's no powerhouse, it certainly isn't a slouch either, making it good enough for most basic missions. It won't turn any heads, but a pair of large lasers is nothing to sneeze at, even if you're stomping around in the heaviest of assault mechs. And not only that, but... <sighs> I guess I can't go ignoring it much longer, can I? Alright, fine. I haven't been making as many jokes as I normally do, and some of you are probably about to pass out from boredom, so I guess it's time to break out the memes. Enjoy! That's the Crab. It's a fairly unremarkable machine in its combat role. It does the job and not much more. But when used for its true purpose, the genius behind its design becomes obvious for those willing to take a look. 
It's the mech for the little guy, the underpaid grunt who does the hardest work for the smallest reward. If you're on a tight budget, or you're strapped for supplies due to attrition, military incompetence, or your most recent trip to the Canopian brothels, this is the machine to get you back on your feet. Thank you all so much for watching, and special thanks to my patrons in the Mech Warrior tier. Arcos Raid, Spacer, Chef Sung, Delta 505, Robert H, Rivius, Kyle Vidari, Tim Cook, Tomayaga Tudor, Gary Moses Sweeney, and Admiral Chirino. If you'd like to join the ranks yourself and help keep the lights on at Mage HQ, the link is in the description. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and a comment, and consider subscribing so that you can be among the first to see our next lecture when it goes live. Many thanks once again, and until next time, this is Mage Leader, signing off.